The Oath of the Horatii by Jacques-Louis David defines the neoclassical painting style. Creating a sensation due to its striking aesthetic, the work soon became a rallying point for the French as it embodied the ideals and vision of the revolution. David was a classically trained French painter who is most noted for popularizing the neoclassical style and for signing the death warrant of King Louis XVI. One of the most politically active artists of all time, David's life would include revolutionizing art and participating in the great terror of the French Revolution, serving as court painter Napoleon, and finally living out his days in exile. Winning the Prix de Rome, a prestigious contest that funded five years of study in Rome, David set out for Italy saying, the antique will not seduce me, it lacks animation, it does not move. How wrong he was. His life, his art, and his character would be profoundly shaped by his time in Rome and his exposure to the ideals of the Roman Republic. While in Rome, David was drawn to Poussin, Caravaggio, and Caracci, and he was introduced to Raphael Mengs, an artist who had embraced the classical art and values of ancient Rome. David was also able to tour the newly excavated city of Pompeii, and his immersion into the art and thought of Rome was complete. David returned to Paris shortly before the French Revolution broke out, and he returned with a new aesthetic and brash confidence that would prove to be an exact match to the needs of France's new government. Quickly admitted to the French Academy, a necessary step for an artist wanting to make a livable wage, David's talent was rewarded by the king with lodging at the Louvre and a royal commission to paint Horace, defended by his father. Once he received this commission, he declared, I can only paint Romans in Rome. With his father-in-law funding the trip, David packed up his family and with several students traveled back to Rome. This trip to Rome would solidify his personal style and usher in the neoclassical era in French art. Neoclassical in short means new classical and the style developed in reaction to the frivolous over-the-top style of Rococo that exemplified the court life of Louis XIV in France. Rococo gloried in and flaunted wealth, luxury, and hedonism. As France moved into an era of hard economic times, her people began to resent the excesses of the rich. As the early rumblings of reform grew, so did the demand for a new style of art that reflected the shifts in society. As the name implies, neoclassical art refers back to the classical world of ancient Greece and Rome. In particular, this is a resurgence in both the aesthetics and the values of the Roman Republic. This idealized understanding of ancient Rome became a template that the emerging post-revolution government of France would gravitate toward. Stoicism, virtue, reason would all be elevated. Personal sacrifices for the common good would be glorified. Nobility would no longer be tied to your birth, but to your character. So neoclassical art harkens back to classical times, both in its aesthetic and its message. Using the Oath of the Horatia as our neoclassical model, we can clearly see the work is based on what was known of Roman art. The composition resembles a Roman frieze. We have the flowing drapery of the togas of the Caesars and the classical architecture, which recalls the newly unearthed ruins of Pompeii. Even the message of the painting is Roman. Using a historical narrative that depicts a pivotal moment in Roman history, David gives us a lesson on what it means to be a good citizen. The story of the Horatii brothers emphasized the need for heroism, courage, and sacrifice. The three brothers willingly sacrificed their lives for Rome and placed the good of the state above personal interests. The theme of self-sacrifice, courage, and loyalty are going to be needed in the next few years if the revolution was going to succeed. So when we look at neoclassical paintings, we're not just observing a style, but the message. And the message is often wrapped up in what it means to be a good citizen, and then promoting the value of reason and rationality over emotion and familial ties. Often, neoclassical paintings would reference historical stories of ancient Rome. Neoclassical works were exemplified by simplicity, dignity of style that was highly organized and harmonious. The compositions were restricted to the midground of the work, with very little backgrounds included. In essence, every element of the neoclassical style contrasted sharply with the Rococo style that was popular with the court. This juxtaposition of the art of the revolutionaries with the art of the court emphasized to the world the contrasting values of each group. 
This is, of course, a gross oversimplification of history, art, politics, and the revolution. However, taking advantage of this oversimplification with black and white presentations of facts is what David used to produce propaganda for the revolutionary government. Exerting an equal influence on the development of Jacques-Louis David and his art was also the Enlightenment thinkers of his day. The Enlightenment was an intellectual movement of the 17th and 18th centuries that emphasized reason and the evidence of the senses over tradition and fixed dogmas. In particular, French Enlightenment proponents were opposed to the absolute power of the monarch and to the idea that one man was better than another purely as a matter of birth. They felt reason, not religion, should be the source of knowledge, and they valued progress, toleration, liberty, and fraternity, believing that men were capable of ruling themselves. The success of the American Revolution and the establishment of a government that separated church and state and was ruled by a constitution had put flesh onto Enlightenment ideals, and in France, it provided a call to their own revolution. Now, one of the leading Enlightenment thinkers, Denis Diderot, put out a call for art that would lift up virtuous acts and make vice appear odious. Diderot called out the frivolous nature of Rococo art, which glorified the immoral and corrupt behavior of the nobility and glamorized the very character flaws that were destroying French society. King Louis XVI was sympathetic to the Enlightenment thinkers, not that he was going to abdicate the throne or anything, but he was instituting reforms. He certainly was not the extravagant monarch that his grandfather Louis XIV was. King Louis XVI appointed Count d'Anglever to a position that could roughly be summed up as the Minister of Arts. D'Anglever agreed with Diderot that art should improve public morals, and his first official act was to ban indecent nudity from the Salon of 1775. We'll talk more about the Salon in a moment. D'Anglever commissioned a series of didactic paintings of French history meant to give moral instruction. One of these commissions went to David, with the instructions that the work should be allegorical and teach that citizens should be loyal to the state, or in France's case, loyal to the king. Arguably, patriotism and loyalty to the state are the message of this work. However, because the story is about a Republican government, it came to represent the struggle against the king and the sacrifice needed to establish a republic modeled after Rome. When the work was finished and displayed at the Salon in 1885, it created such a stir that the hours had to be extended to accommodate all those who wished to view the work. I feel the exhibit of the Oath of the Horatii at the French Salon of 1785 was David's first taste of how art can shape politics and thought. We will explore this more later, but I know you might wonder why this long explanation of an art show that I'm going to go into now. In a few short years, David would become a radical revolutionary who would play a key role in the French Revolution, holding a variety of positions within the new government, including signing the death warrant of the king, supporting the great terror that would execute thousands. David's key role would be as a propagandist. He would use art to sway a nation and portray as noble those who viciously eliminated all who opposed them. David's journey down that path begins here with this showing at the Salon. The Salon was the official exhibition of the French Academy and the greatest annual or sometimes biennial, depending on what was going on that year, art show in the world. And for more than a hundred years, the Salon in many ways ruled the art world and determined what was fashionable. Far more than an art show, the Salon had the power to make or break an artist's career. We might wonder at the importance of the Salon to Paris society at large, as it's hard to imagine an art show creating a society-wide commotion today. But in the 1700s, choices of entertainment were limited and the salon showings were free and open to the public. Art was generally owned by the wealthy nobility and displayed in palaces, but during the weeks of the salon, everyone could walk into the Louvre and view the best art in France. This made the salon popular with the people of Paris, while also providing artists exposure to those who might commission a work. Admission of a work to the salon exhibition was the goal of every artist, and getting past the jury that chose the pieces 
was no small feat. During the 1700s, the salon had strict ideas of what constituted great art, and they tolerated very little deviation. Among the standards were complex rules about linear perspectives, specific guidelines for how you handled light, and directions on how you could use color. There was a hierarchy of genres in art, and history paintings were the pinnacle of that hierarchy. History paintings were to communicate moral lessons and be painted on large canvases. In the illustration, you can see the size of the Oath of the Horatii compared to the portraits and landscapes. The work measured approximately 10 by 13 feet, and even displayed close to the ceiling, it commands attention. Evidently wanting to boost the odds that he and his painting would create a stir, David had set out a story that he had been killed by robbers while traveling from Rome back to Paris. The story spread and many flocked to the Louvre to see the work of this promising new artist who had met such a terrible fate. Then, miraculously, David appeared at the show unharmed and his work was drawing record crowds. The hours of the salon had to be extended during the eight weeks the work was on display. No one had ever seen a painting quite like this before. Johann Wickelmann, another neoclassical artist, described it as having a noble simplicity and sedate grandeur. The story of the Oath of the Horatii is taken from the writings of Livy, an ancient Roman historian. His history of Rome wound together legend and historical fact, and in that history we find the story of the Horatii brothers. At that time, Rome was not a united kingdom, but a collection of city-states or tribes and the Romans and the Albans were at war. However, those two shared a common enemy, the Etruscans. Rome and Alba were anticipating a battle with the Etruscans, and so they didn't want to weaken their own armies by fighting one another, so they came to an interesting compromise. The leaders decided that each of them would choose three warriors who would battle to the death, and whoever won in this contest would rule the other, and then together they would fight their common enemies. In a moment of supreme symmetry, each side chose triplet brothers to be their champions. The Romans selected the Horatii brothers, the Albans selected the Curatii brothers. To complicate the story further, the Horatii and the Curatii families were linked by marriage. Camilla, a Horatii, is betrothed to one of the Curatii fighters. Sabina is a Curatius and her husband is Horatius. For the women, this fight cannot end well. They're going to either lose husband or betrothed or a brother. At the end of the day, there is one Horatii brother left standing. Everyone else is dead on the field of battle. Despite the loss of two brothers, the Horatii were victorious and the Romans returned home jubilant. As they approached the city, the one surviving brother saw his sister Camilla weeping because her beloved fiance was dead. The brother, enraged that his sister put her personal sentiments above her duty to Rome, drew his sword and killed her. Now many artists have chosen to paint the moment that Camilla is killed by her brother, as it's the moment of high drama, but David has chosen to represent a moment that is not recorded in Livy. Instead, he gives us the moment in the story he imagines happening, the moment the father asks his three sons to sacrifice themselves for the Republic and to swear to fight to the death. The Oath of the Horatii celebrates Stoicism, masculinity, and patriotism. Despite its sculptural feel, the work conveys intense emotion and physicality. While there's drama and a great deal of intensity to the work, the action is frozen in this moment. Everything in the painting is controlled. It's perfectly balanced and purposeful. We can feel David's desire to eliminate any unnecessary details so that our attention is focused on his vision of what the ideal citizen should be. We have a dramatic scene playing out before us with three groups of figures. Each of them is framed by one of the three arches in the background. Now there are three figures on the left, man in the center and a grouping of women on the right. And the scene is a closed composition, meaning that all of the action is contained in the picture. In an open composition, we can see the action would be spilling off of the canvas, which invites us to wonder what's occurring beyond the picture frame. Using a closed composition adds to the neoclassical feeling of this work. There is a constrained simplicity that focuses our attention. David has removed 
anything extraneous from the scene so that our focus isn't divided but sharp. The orthogonal lines of this painting converge on the father's hands, creating a dynamic picture despite the stillness that we sense. Orthogonal lines are normally diagonal lines that an artist draws that recede to a vanishing point, and Renaissance artists use this method to create and maintain a consistent perspective in their drawings. And a strong use of orthogonal lines gives a painting a stable, consistent feeling. But instead of a vanishing point that is sighted on the horizon of a landscape, David has focused our attention on the father's hands, which surprisingly are gripping the blades of the three swords. But again, David is focusing our attention on the oath, using the structure of the painting to emphasize the meaning that he wishes to convey. As we focus on the men in the painting, we note that they're strong, tall, upright, perhaps even rigid in their poses. Their legs form triangles, the most stable form in art. Their arms are extended in perfectly straight lines toward their swords as they presumably take their oaths, a posture that will come to be copied by the fascists of the 20th century. Their posture emphasizes both their resolve in this moment and their unity as comrades in arms. The taut, clean lines portray men who are fully engaged with no reservations about what they are promising to accomplish. Their father raises his arm and his face is resolute as he asks them to pledge their very lives to the cause. For David, this is the good citizen, men who exhibit strength, loyalty, and a stoic resolve. The three brothers reveal no outward emotions, only this restrained dignity, demonstrating that they are clearly men of heroic character. The men have a sense of purpose, a strength of brotherhood. Now this is in sharp contrast to the women. The women are created using curved lines, bending under the weight of the upcoming fight. Their postures are rounded inward, emphasizing that they can't think past the coming personal and familial losses. They are passive victims with no agency to act. Their weakness indicates the fragility of their character. This portrayal plays to Enlightenment philosopher Rousseau's writings that stated women could not be good citizens due to their emotional weak nature, which only considered family, not the success of the state. Even the architecture details in the background echo the strong use of curved versus straight lines. David depicts masculine resolution in the straight arm and legs of the brothers, reflecting the strong columns in the background. In contrast, female sensitivity is portrayed in the curves of the women, echoing the arches which are supported by the columns. As we've discussed above, David has drawn a clear line between the men's strength and the women's weakness, and he continues this theme with the gaze. In art, we pay attention to where figures look, how they're looking at each other, the eyes give us a glimpse into the inner person. Here we have all of the men's gaze unfalteringly on the blades. They're focused, intent, and we imagine even unblinking as they pledge their lives to this fight. In contrast, the women's eyes are closed, again, highlighting their victimhood, their inability to change or shape their world. They instead have closed their eyes to block out reality and slumped in defeat. Everywhere we look in this painting, there are groups of three. Three brothers, three women, three blades, three arches, three arms raised in salute. The three arches are framing the work and divided up into thirds. The brothers are framed in the first arch, the women in the last with the father in the middle. And the arches highlight the father who is about to sacrifice his sons for the glory of Rome. Now we've talked about but not examined the three swords in the center of this work. Several drawings of the swords have survived, but in the final painting, David changed the blades so that only one is a straight blade, the other two are curved blades. And given our earlier discussion on how David has used straight versus curved lines, it's been suggested that the two curved blades are foreshadowing the deaths of the two brothers. The three arms raised in salute as they take their oath is a pose that captured the imagination for many who would view the work. And in a few years, David would use the same salute when he drew the tennis court oath, where the leaders of France's revolution swore loyalty to the cause of constitutional republic. In the next decade, many fascist leaders would adopt the raised arm salute, um, most notoriously the Nazis. An interesting consideration of the story is that all of these six men knew each other before they fought. Their families had intermarried. They were in-laws. The brothers had met, and they shared probably nieces and nephews. 
While the men exhibit stoicism at the prospect of going to battle against men who were basically extended family, perhaps even friends, the reality of the situation is that running a blade through someone you know is very different than killing an anonymous enemy. This line of thought makes me wonder if with those two curved blades, David is hinting that in the heat of the moment, the two slain brothers had paused, had succumbed for a moment to the womanly emotions associated with family and that that had been their downfall. They had died because they too were curved, weakened by familial love. In the years ahead, the French Revolution would call on citizens to make just these sorts of choices. Will you choose state or family? Where do your loyalties lie? And what are you willing to sacrifice for the glory of France? Now, neoclassical art, while wholly new and of its time, also obviously harkens back to the sculptures of ancient Rome. The figures in the oath of the Horatii appear sculpted. The physiques of the men are powerful. They go beyond powerful, actually. I mean, just look at the physicality of the legs, the heavy musculature, even on a knee. The muscled calves have veins standing out like the sculptures of Rome, and we're presented with an idealized physical perfection. Now, in the ancient world, physical beauty was equated with moral pureness. Artists across the millennia have drawn parallels between internal and external beauty. And so the physical perfection of the men in this work serves the purpose of indicating high moral character. David was classically trained and he spent years learning to accurately draw the autonomy of the human body, often drawing from Greco-Roman sculptures. In fact, David generally drew his figures onto canvases in the nude and then added the clothing. And in that way, he could be sure that the clothing would drape over the body properly. It has been noted that this work resembles the narrative friezes that adorned the buildings of the ancient world. With little background, all of the action pushed up into the middle of the composition and that frozen feeling of the figures, especially the men, we have this carefully composed tableau. As David finished this austere composition with its powerful figures, he said, I do not know whether I shall ever paint another like it. Now, another key element to any painting is an artist's use of color. And the most striking color in this work is that of the father's red cloak. Draping beautifully over his shoulder, the cloak swathes him in red. After just spending a great deal of time personally writing about religious works, it's hard not to associate the red with blood and sacrifice. As this father is sending his sons to battle and knowing that two of them will die, I can't help but feel the father has his son's deaths or blood on his shoulders. I doubt this is the message David was making as he was trying to glorify what the men in the family were undertaking, but perhaps he wanted to emphasize the sacrifice involved. If we go to the women in their more muted colors, Camilla's white gown stands out. White is understood to mean purity and innocence in this moment. Camilla's innocence is about to be shattered. Camilla will lose two brothers, her betrothed, and finally her own life at the hand of a brother. The world of this family is about to be shattered and the victory they win, like the French revolutionaries to come, is going to be short-lived. On the left, we see the brother in the foreground, the surviving brother, clothed in garments that mimic his father, but with a white cloak slung over his shoulder. His clothing tells us that he will be the only survivor of this battle, and the cloak foreshadows his murder of Camilla, his sister. Not long after this work was shown at the French Salon, David would become embroiled in the tumultuous politics of the French Revolution. As we've noted, the oath of the Horatii created quite a stir at the Salon of 1785, and as revolutionary talk began to grow, this painting became a rallying point. The visual of a good citizen pledging his life and fortune to the Republic, forsaking family and ease for the good of the nation, held a strong appeal. We know that visual images can evoke strong emotional responses in both individuals and societies. Think of the image of the World Trade Center just after it was hit and the visceral response it evokes in Americans. That is the power of image, the power of art. When carefully orchestrated, it becomes the power of propaganda. David would embrace creating propaganda, and we will be looking at several of those works in the coming months. But the Oath of the Horatii was the first, perhaps unintentional, propaganda work of the French Revolution. The original Oath of the Horatii is displayed in the David Room at the Louvre in Paris. However, it's not the only copy that we have of the work. A replica was ordered from David by the high-ranking courtier, Count 
I'm horrible with these French names, De Vendril. It is not quite identical to the original. You can tell that this is the second edition because there's a distaff with spun thread near the women's feet. Now I'm going to be continuing this series on the art of David, so be sure to subscribe if you want to learn more about this fascinating artist. And as time goes on, I'll be linking the other works down here below. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like this video by giving us a thumbs up below and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss great commentary on classic works of art. KellyBagdanoff.com is your source for great content and curriculum, as well as devotional materials using the medium of art. Make sure you visit and subscribe. Pablo Picasso said, art washes from the soul the dust of everyday life. So take a moment to share this video because art is too important not to share. See you later, alligator.